Dear Esther, the morning after I was washed ashore, salt in my ears, sand in my mouth, and the waves always at my ankles, I felt as though everything had conspired to this one last shipwreck. I remembered nothing but water, stones in my belly and my shoes, threatening to drag me under to where only the most listless of creatures swim. Donnelly reported the legend of the Hermit, a holy man who sought solitude in its most pure form. Allegedly, he rode here from the mainland in a boat without a bottom, so all the creatures of the sea could rise at night to converse with him. How disappointed he must have been with their chatter. Perhaps now, when all that haunts the ocean is the rubbish dumped from the tankers, he'd find more peace. They say he threw his arms wide in a valley on the south side and the cliff opened up to provide him shelter. They say he died of fever 116 years later. The shepherds left gifts for him at the mouth of the cave, but Donnelly records they never claimed to have seen him. I have visited the cave and I have left my gifts, but like them, I appear to be an unworthy subject of his solitude. At night, you can see the lights sometimes from a passing tanker or trawler. From up on the cliffs, they are mundane. But down here, they fugue into ambiguity. For instance, I cannot readily tell if they belong above or below the waves. The distinction now seems banal. Why not everything and all at once? There's nothing better to do here than indulge in contradictions whilst waiting for the fabric of life to unravel. reading Donnelly by the weak afternoon sunlight. He landed on the south side of the island, followed the path to the bay and climbed the mount. He did not find the caves and he did not chart the north side. I think this is why his understanding of the island is flawed, incomplete. 
He stood on the mount and only wondered momentarily how to descend. But then, he didn't have my reasons. When someone had died or was dying, or was so ill they gave up what little hope they could sacrifice, they cut parallel lines into the cliff, exposing the white chalk beneath. You could see them from the mainland or the fishing boats, and know to send aid or impose a cordon of protection, and wait a generation until whatever pestilence stalked the cliff paths died along with its hosts. My lines are just for this to keep any would-be rescuers at bay. The infection is not simply of the flesh. I quote directly, a motley lot with little to recommend them. I have now spent three days in their company. That is, I fear, enough for any man not born amongst them. Despite their tedious inclination to quote scripture, they seem to me the most godforsaken of all the inhabitants of the Outer Isles. Indeed, in this case, the very gravity of that term, forsaken by God, seems to find its very apex. It appears to me that Donnelly, too, found those who wander this shoreline to be adrift from any chance of redemption. Did he include himself in that, I wonder? Dear Esther, I met Paul. I made my own little pilgrimage. My Damascus, a small semi-detached on the outskirts of Wolverhampton. We drank coffee in his kitchen and tried to connect to one another. Although he knew I hadn't come in search of an apology, reason or retribution, he still spiralled in panic, thrown high and lucid by his own dented bonnet. Responsibility had made him old. Like us, he'd already passed beyond any conceivable boundary of life. Dear Esther, I have now driven the stretch of the M5 between Exeter and Bristol over 21 times. But although I have all the reports and all the witnesses and have cross-referenced them within a millimetre using my ordnance survey maps, I simply cannot find the location. You'd think there would be marks to serve as some evidence. It's somewhere between the turn-off for Sanford and the welcome brake services. But although I can always see it in my rearview mirror, I have as yet been unable to pull ashore.
all night the boy has kept me lucid. I sat when I was at the very edge of despair, when I thought I would never unlock the secret of the island. I sat at the edge and I watched the idiot boy blink through the night. He's mute and he's retarded and he has no thought in his metal head but to blink each wave and each minute aside until the morning comes and renders him blind as well as deaf mute. In many ways, we have much in common. There must be a hole in the bottom of the boat. How else could new hermits have arrived? I had kidney stones and you visited me in the hospital. After the operation, when I was still half submerged in anaesthetic, your outline and your speech both blurred. Now my stones have grown into an island and made their escape and you have been rendered opaque by the car of a drunk.
I've begun my ascent on the windless slope of the western side. The setting sun was an inflamed eye squeezing shut against the light shone in by the doctors. My neck is aching through constantly craning my head up to track the light of the aerial. I must look downwards, follow the path under the island to a new beginning. was constructed originally in the early 1700s. By then, shepherding had formalized into a career. The first habitual shepherd was a man called Jacobson from a lineage of migratory Scandinavians. He was not considered a man of breeding by the mainlanders. He came here every summer whilst building the bothy, hoping eventually that becoming a man of property would secure him a wife and a lineage. Donnelly records that it did not work. He caught some disease from his malcontented goats and died two years after completing it. There was no one to carve white lines into the cliff for him either. to make of Donnelly, the laudanum and the syphilis. It is clearly not how he began, but I've been unable to discover if the former was a result of his visiting the island or the force that drove him here. For the syphilis, a drunk driver smashing his insides into a pulp as he stumbled these paths, I can only offer my empathy. We're all victims of our age. My disease is the internal combustion engine and the cheap fermentation of yeast. They found Jacobson in early spring. The thaw had only just come. Even though he'd been dead nearly seven months, his body had been frozen right down to the nerves and had not even begun to decompose. All around him, small flowers were reaching for the weak sun. The goats had adjusted happily to life without a shepherd and were grazing freely about the valley. Donnelly reports they hurled the body in fear and disgust down the shaft. But I cannot corroborate this story. Climbing down to the caves, I slipped and fell and have injured my leg. I think the femur is broken. It is clearly infected. The skin has turned a bright, tight pink, and the pain is crashing in on waves, winter tides against my shoreline, drowning out the ache of my stones. I struggled back to the bothy to rest, but it has become clear that there is only one way this is likely to end. The medical supplies I looted from the trawler have suddenly found their purpose. They will keep me lucid for my final ascent. Did Jacobson crawl this far? Can I identify the scratches his nails ruined into the rocks? Am I following him cell for cell, inch for inch? Why did he turn back on himself and not carry through to the ascent?
There is no other direction, no other exit from this motorway. Speeding past this junction, I saw you waiting at the roadside, a one last drink in your trembled hands. I'm traversing my own death throes. The infection in my leg is an oil rig that dredges black muck up from deep inside my bones. I swallow fistfuls of diazepam and paracetamol to stay conscious. The pain flows through me like an underground sea.
When I was coming round from the operation, I remember the light they shone in my eyes to check for pupil contraction. It was like staring up at a moonlit sky from the bottom of a well. People moved at the summit, but I could not tell if you were one of them. Sanford Junction, headlights in your retinas. Donnelly drove a grey hatchback without a bottom. All the creatures of the tarmac rose to sing to him. 
All manner of symbols crudely scrawled across the cliff face of my unrest. My life reduced to an electrical diagram. All my gulls have taken flight. They will no longer roost on these outcrops. The lure of the moon over the Sanford Junction is too strong. soil I chose fire. It seemed the more contemporary of the options, the more sanitary. I could not bear the thought of the reassembly of such a ruin. Stitching arm to shoulder and femur to hip, charting a line of thread like traffic stilled on a motorway, making it all acceptable for tearful aunts and traumatized uncles flown in specially for the occasion. Reduce to ash, mix with water, make a phosphorescent paint for these rocks and ceilings. By the roadside, by the exit for Damascus, all ticking and cooled, all feathers and remorse, all of these signals rooted like traffic through the circuit diagrams of our guts, those badly ridden boats torn bottomless in the swells, washing us forever ashore. Here, I can see my armada. I collected all the letters I'd ever meant to send to you, if I'd have ever made it to the mainland, but had instead collected at the bottom of my rucksack, and I spread them out along the lost beach. Then I took each and every one, and I folded them into boats. I folded you into the creases, and then, as the sun was setting, I set the fleet to sail. Shattered into 21 pieces, I consigned you to the Atlantic, and I sat here until I'd watched all of you sink.
When Paul keeled over dead on the road to Damascus, they resuscitated him by hitting him in the chest with stones gathered by the roadside. He was lifeless for 21 minutes, certainly long enough for the oxygen levels in his brain to have decreased and caused hallucinations and delusions of transcendence. I'm running out of painkillers, and the moon has become almost unbearably bright. begun my voyage in a paper boat without a bottom. I will fly to the moon in it. I've been folded along a crease in time, a weakness in the sheet of life. Now you've settled on the opposite side of the paper to me. I can see your traces in the ink that soaks through the fiber, the pulped vegetation. When we become waterlogged and the cage disintegrates, we will intermingle. When this paper aeroplane leaves the cliff edge and carves parallel vapor trails in the dark, we will come together. If only Donnelly had experienced this, he would have realized he was his own shoreline, as am I. Just as I am becoming this island, so he became his syphilis, retreating into the burning synapses, the stones, the infection. Returning to my car afterwards, hands still shaking and a head split open by the impact. Goodbye to tearful aunts and traumatized uncles. Goodbye to the phenomenal. Goodbye to the tangible. Goodbye Wolverhampton. Goodbye Sanford. Goodbye Cromer. Goodbye Damascus. This cliff path is slippery in the dew. It is hard to climb with such an infection. I must carve out the bad flesh and sling it from the aerial. I must become infused with the very air.
perched on a spent bonnet, sideways, whilst the sirens fell through the middle distance and the metal moaned in grief about us. I'm about this night in walking, old bread and gull bones, old Donnelly at the bar gripping his drink, old Esther walking with our children, old Paul as ever, old Paul. He shakes and he shivers and he turns off his lights alone. Vapor trails in the air, white lines etched into these rocks. Dear Esther, I have burnt my belongings, my books, this death certificate. Mine will be written all across this island. Who was Jacobson? Who remembers him? Donnelly has written of him, but who was Donnelly? Who remembers him? I have painted, carved, hewn, scored into this space all that I could draw from him. There will be another to these shores to remember me. I will rise from the ocean like an island without bottom, come together like a stone, become an aerial, a beacon, that they will not forget you. We have always been drawn here. One day the gulls will return and nest in our bones and our history. I will look to my left and see Esther Donnelly flying beside me. I will look to my right and see Paul Jacobson flying beside me. They will leave white lines carved into the air to reach the mainland, where help will be sent 